G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and the Eagles Corner. Today we are going to be talking about the upcoming set of preseason games uh, from a West Coast perspective in particular. So I'm going to be talking about some things that I want to see from the Eagles when we see them in action for the first time. Uh, off the top of my head, I think we're playing the both of the South Australian teams. I didn't double check that, but it's kind of inconsequential because I think what we're looking for, uh, when we look at the Eagles this preseason, we're just looking for signs of improvement naturally. And the, the opposition is not super material to this. That being said, I think the games sort of kick off around late February. There's an organized round of preseason like scratchies from about the 27th of Feb. And I'm not too sure when the match simulation ones happen. Those are the unofficial games. I think they might happen a week before. I'm not even sure if that's confirmed. But regardless, we're going to talk about some things that we can realistically hope to see from the Eagles this preseason. Now, there's some broader things to consider. You know, obviously, the first one is we don't want to see injuries, right? When you consider last year's injury list, obviously, uh, we have to bear in mind the fact that I think we got to about round three before things started to get bad. So this time last year and throughout the, the preseason, we were all good. So touch wood, we can get through it a little bit longer. So I won't labor too much on the injury part, but obviously we just don't want to see injuries to, to anyone on the list, whether it be a key player that's gonna be helpful to us remaining competitive this year, or if it's a young guy with talent, we don't wanna see injuries. So that one's kind of obvious. I will put out another disclaimer here. I'm recording this a little bit early because I have a trip down to London soon, so I'm trying to batch produce content a little bit. So you might see this, it is currently Feb 4th, I don't know what day I'll release this yet, but you might see this a week after I filmed it, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, nothing I say in this video gets made to look redundant because of some sort of ridiculous injury. I'm actually gonna touch the entertainment unit because it's got wood in it. There we go. So nonetheless, I'm gonna talk about some broad structural things. You know, naturally there's, there's a couple of things that come to mind, all right? What, what do we wanna see from the Eagles? But we also have to consider, you know, is it realistic to expect answers from two preseason games uh, as to some of the burning questions that we have? So we talked about injuries, like I said, Yes, we don't wanna see injuries, but obviously getting through the preseason unscathed is not necessarily going to guarantee that we won't later fall victim to them. I know that's a really bleak way to start this analysis. Um, but another one that comes to mind obviously is in addition to the injuries when we were so undermanned, one thing that was absolutely diabolical from Eagles point of view last year was the periods of games where we would just go completely uncompetitive. Now, this isn't solely due to injuries, but we do know that this problem got worse the more injuries we got because you know, in maybe 2021, we started to see these long lapses where we just couldn't stifle the opposition momentum. And, you know, those those streaks would probably result in about five goals in about eight minutes. You know, that's, that's something that predates the injuries to some extent. Then you get to 2022, we have bad injuries. And, you know, those goal swings start to become eight or nine, right? And then in 2023, and I know the injuries got worse, but the, the lapses of games where we would concede tons of inside 50s with absolutely no pressure... Some of those goal streaks became, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I'd say 10 plus, and in some cases, maybe more. I shudder to think the goal streaks we conceded against Hawthorne, where we only kicked like three or four goals for that entire game, against Fremantle in one of the last games of the season, and of course against Sydney. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you can see, obviously, it got way worse. So what I'm really getting at here is, obviously we want to see that change for the Eagles in 2024. Now there will be lapses, they're gonna be a young side, they're, they're gonna be able to, the ability to stay on it and committed for the entire four quarters is going to take us time to build up to, okay? I understand that. And that is another thing that we probably won't see or be able to test effectively throughout the preseason games. The intensity is gonna be different. Um, you know, there may be lapses. I do remember last year we did beat Port Adelaide, I think at Lathlane in our first preseason game, only to put in a horrendous performance against Adelaide. So sometimes it's indicative, but obviously in the first game, if we beat Port Adelaide and they finished third last year, it's not a true test. So uh, in this video, I'm gonna probably highlight some more of the mechanics that I'm looking forward to seeing. The other one I'll touch on is, Obviously, we want to see us play a more cohesive game style. And in, in pockets, I think we have shown real progress in this area. From the outside looking in, you might be like, how the hell do you think West Coast have built towards a more uh, sustainable game style and shown improvement? But the truth is it did actually happen in 2023. Obviously, there were games where we were completely shithouse. And yet there were probably five or six games. We had three wins. We had two more close losses. Then there was the Derby is probably the sixth game I'd include in that, where when we were playing those games on our terms for periods, we did play in a very different style to the, you know, 2018 to 2021 era. 
And by that, I'm, I'm referring to fast ball movement, you know, being a little bit less conservative with the way we use the footy. That was something that really plagued us at the back end of 2021. And I've said in previous videos, that was where I kind of felt like a rot was coming. I'm pleased to say that, you know, even round one against North, round two against GWS, round three against Fremantle before the injuries hit, at least we were playing differently. And our runoff halfback was a lot more incisive. And I'd say that continued at the back end of the season. You know, aside from the Fremantle game, I'd say we kind of looked like a different team to some extent for four out of those last five final games with the way we use the footy. So again, I know I'm laboring on that point, but that is probably also something we won't be able to really test in the preseason because we see in preseason games sometimes, and it's not just us, teams come out for a scratch match and they look like they're playing with lead in their shoes because they are, in some cases, you know, that they kind of overload players and make them play those preseason games fatigue. Something I've heard through the grapevine a little bit. As another way of conditioning, they'll put players through like heavy training loads right before the game. It's a whole sports science thing, obviously not my area of expertise. So our ability to move the ball quickly, we might not see that in the preseason. But let's talk about some things that I would like to see, okay? And I've labored about all of the other things that we probably can't test in the preseason. But let's talk about forward line functionality. I have talked about this previously, but specifically we've, we've brought in Matthew Flynn as a first choice Ruckman. And the subsequent move after that is going to be that Bailey Williams plays predominantly more as a ruck forward, which, you know, is probably the role that he is most suited to, particularly when you consider that was what he was mostly drafted at. I don't think this guy was ever drafted to the West Coast Eagles with the vision that he would be the number one ruck. And he did a fantastic job in 2023, you know, inexperienced, probably a little bit undersized still for the role he plays. Um, no Nick Natanui the entire year. I think Bailey Williams had a fantastic year, but it is going to be a new challenge for him to push forward. And not only for him, we, we, we would like to see the evolution of him as a forward. We started to see some more contested marks for him around the ground. I think his set shot kicking is probably the next thing he needs to really tighten up to become an effective ruck forward. Uh, but then there's also the flow on effect of what it does to the rest of our forward line. And we're obviously gonna assume everyone's fit. Oscar Allen is obviously the number one key forward, and I do have hope that Jack Darling can get back a little bit to, to some decent form. Uh, I'm still hopeful of that. I don't think for him, age is gonna be a massive concern. I think the way he plays his style, he's very much a one-on-one -on -one strong contested forward now who can absorb a defender. And so he doesn't need to kick 50 goals for him to have an effective season. I think if he's just an effective secondary option to Oscar Allen in 2024, then I think we can get some real value out of that. So we've got Allen, Darling, we've got Williams as a third tour. There's also Ryan Marrick to consider. Now I did read somewhere that, you know, the Eagles had a match team not too long ago and they had a strong team versus probably a team of seconds. Now, apparently they went with a forward line that included Ryan Marrick. I really want to see Ryan Marrick in this team. I did a best 22 earlier or late last year where I kind of had him outside the 22, but this wasn't based on skill. It kind of feeds back into this structural issue that I was, I'm alluding to here where is that too tall a forward line? Now, first of all, it seems like the intent might be from a West Coast point of view to actually play all of these guys in the same forward line. And historically, we have gone with tall forward lines in the past, but we did also have Josh Kennedy. The star power of these talls that we have on the list, I mean, there's some young talent in there, doesn't quite compare to what it was, you know, even from the entire decade of 2010 to 2020. Like that was a real strength of our team was our tall forwards. The good thing about Marek though, I will say is while he is technically a tall forward, I think he does have the capacity to almost play as a high half forward. If he can play as almost like a link up player further down the ground, I've been huge on this kid's field kicking and I think his kicks inside 50 could be a massive boost to us if we can utilize him in the right way. Not necessarily playing close to goal, I think he's got a lot of bulking up to do anyway. So him having out, him being like one out with a defender in the goal square is probably not his bag. But if we can get him a little bit away from goal, get him leading up at the footy, moving the ball inside 50 with his elite kicking, I think there is a way that all four of those forwards can fit into the same team. And that's one thing I'm really keen to see how it works this preseason. Another point is probably just our midfield dynamic and how that works. And specifically, you know, I'm liking what I'm seeing of Elliot Yo playing a fair bit in the midfield. Now, I know this one's touchy because this guy hasn't played more than about, I think, 12 games since 2019. I think that was what I said in a video the other day. Uh, that being said, you know, you can contemplate what our first choice midfield is, right? And I must say, uh, I, I enjoy what Tim Kelly's done for us in the last couple of years, and he is a good number one mid. But after that, it falls away badly when you consider that Gaff and Sheed haven't been in the greatest of form 
in recent years either. So if we're going with the starting combo of Gaff, Sheed, and Kelly, uh, that is not a midfield that strikes fear into the heart of the opposition. Now, we've got Liam Duggan, who's probably going to roll through there at times, provide a bit of a defensive edge, and we have Ruben Jinby and obviously Harley Reid too. Um, those guys are expected to get some midfield minutes. That being said, they're still very young. So my point being here is if you add a fit and firing Elliot Yo, at least for bursts in this midfield, I think it on paper makes us a look a lot more competitive. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm pleased to hear that we haven't given up on Yo as a potential midfielder and him getting fit. And if he plays 20 games in a season, that's a huge plus to us as a big body in a rebuilding side. Another guy I'd like to see in here is Tyler Brockman. Like I said, I've been a little bit ignorant to Tyler Brockman. I didn't have that much of an idea of what kind of player he is when he joined West Coast. And you watch his highlights and they, they probably don't really indicate what kind of player he is. Like the highlights that you see on YouTube are very much like him taking a mark out in space and kicking a set shot. Whereas he's described more as a busy, pressure, creative forward. And it just doesn't come across on video, but we've heard good things. And it sounds like I've heard on a number of occasions that he's rolling through stoppages as well as a bit of a part-time midfielder. And I like this, A, because, you know, he's, he's probably had, I think, three pre-seasons now. Well, this is his third, uh, which means, you know, he's a bit more mature than some of the other guys we might have rolling through there. Uh, but also, you know, stylistically, very different to the mix that we've got already as that small sort of quick midfielder. I mean, there's Noah Long, but he hasn't really been exposed to the midfield yet, and I don't expect that to change this year. But Brockman, you know, you compare it to Jinby, Reed, you know, Kelly. Maybe he's more similar to Kelly than the other types, but Sheed, like these guys are bigger bodied, um, and, you know, some of them are quick, some of them are not, but Brockman does add a little bit of something different, and particularly his agility. I'm excited to see what he could do in bursts in this midfield. The next thing I'd like to see is probably, you know, some of the second or third year players in particular starting to get their hands on the footy even more. Brady Hoff is a guy I'm big on, and you look at the way he ended 2023, and there was a big uplift in his production, pretty much from that game where he kept Charlie Cameron goalless. You're looking at his stats, and he started to win a lot more of the footy, and he had 26 disposals in his last game, 12 marks against Adelaide, and I think he's on a really good trajectory. So I'd like to see us get to a point where Hoff is getting the ball 20 times a game. Um, sometimes he's going to be playing as a more of a deeper sort of defender if he's got a if he's got a uh, role to play on a small forward. And other times, and I've heard him say this himself, he might be playing higher up the ground as a more of a rebounding defender. So him getting his hands on the footy would be great to see. But there's guys like Long and Jinby who I would just like to see get more of the football. Obviously, neither of them touched the ball a lot per game in 2023. Understandable. We saw some really good signs. But, you know, if Jinby's starting to crack 20 possessions more often, I think he's only done it once in his career so far. And Noah Long, obviously, is a bit more impact per possession than he is as an accumulator. So obviously I'd like to see those guys get the ball. I'd like to see Burgil in this preseason uh, set of games. You know, it sounds like his hammy's okay. He's basically back to training. Not sure if he's in full training yet, but another player with a real point of difference that I think could, with his attributes as a running defender, still impact quite early at AFL level because he's got the speed and he's got the foot skills. I think Burgil in particular getting through this preseason unscathed and having a bit of a taste of AFL level would be a nice little boost because I'm quietly hoping he is our 2024 surprise packet. And the final point is specifically a bunch of key position players, young ones, getting through this preseason looking fit and healthy and just ready for season 2024. So specifically Harry Edwards and Rhett Bazo. Obviously, you know, Harry Edwards has dealt with, you know, groin and wrist injuries and stuff like that. He hasn't had a real good crack at a preseason, I don't think, for a little while. So him at least being in the position to be called upon in round one if we have an injury would be a great start because I'm a little bit concerned about our key back transition. Barassa and McGovern are good. McGovern's like 32 this year, I think. And, um, you know, Barras is probably three years younger than that, but we do need to start thinking about that transition. So I'm not saying that Rhett Bazo, for instance, has to come in and force his way into the side this year, but I'd love to see him, you know, make some physical uh, strides this year, get fit. Obviously last year he dealt with a shitload of personal stuff in the preseason. He, he did really well last year considering not only what the club was going through, but what he was going through personally as well. But I'm just saying, if Edwards and Bazo are applying their trade in the waffle, they're fit, they're making progress, that's a good start. And it all starts with you know a good preseason, and hopefully we see them a little bit during the preseason games. And Jack Williams is another one I'll consider there. I think the fact that he was able to hold his own at AFL level last year was really impressive when you consider last preseason he ruptured his spleen. So he's coming from a long way back. Probably got a game due to necessity, considering the injuries we had last year. 
but I think really held his own, to be honest, which surprised me. And you can just factor in like, what could this guy do with a actual preseason at AFL level? Again, in a previous video, I said I'd be happy for him to just like play the entire year in the waffle and become one of the better key forwards in the waffle. I think that would be a good year of progress for Jack Williams. But what I'd like to see is him getting a taste at AFL level in the preseason, getting through it unscathed and set him up for a really good 2024. So that is kind of my rambling, my preseason thoughts. That's what I'd like to see. Those are my realistic hopes and expectations for these preseason set of games, which are just around the corner. Like I said, I'm recording this on Feb 4th and you're gonna see it potentially a week after this. So hopefully all of that is still relevant. Touch wood again. But thank you for watching guys. Let me know in the comments your thoughts on what I've said here. Obviously I've uh, been making somewhat regular Eagles content. Uh, Eagles Corner as a video series, I'm intending to keep as a weekly video series just once a week throughout the season. So I'm starting to get into that rhythm now. And uh, to be honest, I'm looking forward to having a pretty solid routine of videos at the moment. It's a little bit of a scramble, but it's still fun. And I uh, hope you're enjoying the content. So for now, I'll say goodbye and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.